Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to join us today, and particularly to those of you who have um, been patient and spent a little bit more time waiting for us to join you. I'm just going to swap my screen so I am looking at you and not to one side. Hopefully you can now all see the slides. There we go. So um, it's my great pleasure today to talk to you about a document that I've been very involved with, with Wounds UK, uh, about assessing skin in darker skin tones and, and looking at skin tone bias. So if you've not seen it, this is the document. It's a best practice statement. And, and we were very fortunate to have a really great group of people working with us. So my co-chair for the day was Lux Middle Moon, uh, who's a TVN for Central and Northwest London. And then we had a variety of other clinicians involved and educators and particularly uh, Nisha who is going to be speaking after me to explain some of the work that she's doing around her doctoral studies but Nisha is the pathway lead in community nursing at the University of, Study, uh, of Surrey. It was really important that we had a mixture of questions that this wasn't just focused on pressure ulcer prevention so we had representation from the lower limb world as well so we had Leon Atkin and um, representing uh, Matter, and we had Becky Elwood or Rebecca Elwood from the uh, lymphedema world as well. But for me, I, I first had this uh, kind of scenario flagged to me when I was challenged as the lead for pressure ulcer prevention uh, about REACT to RED. And we first had a few queries raised in the Stop the Pressure programme about our use of the REACT to RED programme, which was developed separately to the Stop the Pressure programme. And there were some concerns raised about was it really uh, fair and equitable and did it address the needs of people with dark skin tones? So we needed to understand a little bit more about what was going on and the awareness of skin tones and pressure ulcer development and looked across uh, the literature to see what else we had on pressure ulcer development. And actually, if you start to look, there'd been other information published across several decades looking at pressure ulcers in dark skin toned patients. And you can see going back as far as 1988, we'd noticed that patients who have dark skin tones were much more likely to have pressure ulcers, particularly being when admitted to long-term facilities. And we need to think about what that means and what, why we are challenging redness and why redness is a problem. Because redness is something we talk about as a fairly standard piece of terminology. We use it without really thinking because it's part of our everyday lexicon. What we actually mean is erythema and erythema, erythema is a physiological response. And what we are seeing is a representation of the inflammatory response. So you can see from this diagram here where we are looking at what happens in chronic wounds. So whether it's a pressure ulcer, or a venous leg ulcer or a diabetic foot ulcer, actually what you have is lots of, of cellular level activity which causes things to happen like leakage of uh, fluid through the cellular membranes and causes edema and you've got red blood cells leaking and you see that redness from the blood reflected as part of an inflammatory response. But this doesn't just apply to pressure ulcers. As you saw from that diagram, I just showed you there were three different types of wounds there. Also, sends across other elements of nursing care as well. So when we're looking at why the skin might be red, it can be other diseases. So it might be you see patients with redness because they have a chronic dermatological disease like eczema or psoriasis. It might relate to temperature changes. You know yourself, if you've been outside and it's really cold, we get very red cheeks or we get a red nose. And if you drink alcohol, I know if I have a glass of wine, I get very red flush or just on my neck. I don't know why it only happens there, but it does. Equally, if we uh, bring gravity to play, you get redness or you get erythema, that inflammatory response, where you get pooling in venous disease in the lower le legs. If you were to stand on your head for a while, you would see the same flush in your face. We see things like allergy with dermatitis. If you're reacting to something, whether that's a metal or a shellfish or whatever it might be, it might be related to a trauma. So if you've ever been stung by a wasp, I just let one out of my uh, window and unfortunately watched it fly straight into a spider's web, but it's managed to, to escape. You will know that you get that uh, inflammatory response around it. We, we used to call uh, 
patients who've got a very red bottom, a baboon bum, I don't think we use that phrase anymore, but it's, it's a reflection of venous engorgement, of that additional blood supply to the bottom. We certainly see erythema with radiotherapy or sunburn and localized infections such as cellulitis. And there's a whole host of other inflammatory things that, we, that I haven't covered in this list. But what's important about that erythema is that it's a clinical trigger and it triggers us to measure it and to do something to treat it. But it's a very visual stimulation often. And what our most common thing to do is to try and press it. So when we see, and I'm gonna use redness just for ease at the minute until we move into darker skin, we tend to press it to see if it goes white. And that might be with a blanching test <clears throat> such as in pressure ulcers, or it can be a rash like meningitis where we roll the glass over it to see if the color comes from it. If somebody has got inflammation, we'll take the temperature and that might be take the person's temperature to look for a systemic illness, or it might be actually feeling the skin to see if the skin's hot. We very frequently, if it's things like cellulitis, draw around it to see if it extends. Uh, we measure it as an indicator of is that wound infection. So we often have inflammation around a wound and we only start to worry about it if it's infected if we know that this is now past the inflammatory stage that if it's spreading and extending we will try and describe the color change using things like a color scale such as the Munsell scale and um, but there are some disease specific scales like the whole robinson scale the fitzpatrick or the vancouver scar scale we will very often photograph it, so we have cord. We will sometimes look at deeper tissue damage, so looking at things like ultrasound, uh, uh, SEM, or thermography. But that really flags for us the importance of what we see, because if we don't see it, we don't respond to it. So whether that response is to measure or to treat or try and do something to alleviate the cause of the symptoms is all really relevant. And so I want to move on to looking about erythema on different skin tones. And on this diagram here on the left, what you can see is, is a picture of my leg. And if I'm teaching about pressure ulcer prevention, one of the things I will very commonly do is include this picture. This is just me with my legs crossed. And what you can see is I've circled a nice, strong red area. And if you were to press that, it would blanch, it would go white. On the right is a colleague, and this is a colleague with a darker skin tone, and they've done exactly the same thing as I did. They had crossed their legs and left it and waited until the redness should have appeared. But despite the yellow circle that's around it, I'm sure you'll all agree that's actually very difficult to see. And it's only because there is a circle around it, you might just about be able to make out there is a change in the color of the skin. We wouldn't describe that as red, but we would certainly be able to identify that it is a different skin tone. So we need to think about how we describe that. And I think for a lot of people, this is where we start to think about, we get a bit stuttery. We're not quite sure what we should say or how, how we might phrase things or whether we might offend people by using the wrong word or the wrong phrase. And we, we resort to a whole host of things. And certainly if you are looking in um, medical data capture, we tend to talk about people's ethnicity. And we know that ethnicity is not the same as skin color. So if you talk about Asian patients, their skin tones can range from quite light through to really quite dark. And the same with African patients. It's no different from the fact that my sister who is a redhead is really pale and pasty. And I would say I've got a much darker skin compared to her. her. So we shouldn't be relating ethnicity just to skin colour. We should be actually looking at the skin itself. And equally, we shouldn't be comparing the skin to white because that implies the white is the norm. So I know when I started getting interested in this, my first folder that I created of images, I called non-white skin pictures. And it was only after I started to read about this, after I spent time talking to Nisha, that I realized actually that's maybe not the best of terms to use. But also we need to remember that there are some cultural significance associated with the descriptors that you might use. So in some countries, there is um, 
some anxiety about darker skin and certainly in certain certain cultures it seemed to be more beneficial to be of a, a higher standing to have a light skin tone and certainly we see some people who will bleach their skin to look lighter um, and that's usually just the visual areas of the skin that you see getting bleached so there is this thing about this great anxiety about saying the wrong thing about upsetting people so there are different ways described in the literature that we can describe the skin tones. So this is the Fitzpatrick scale. This is a, a scale that's used very much in dermatology um, and it's based on people's response to UV and how easily they do or don't tan. So you can see there are six variants and it's about how you tan or burn and how deeply pigmented your skin is. The other tool that's used a lot, and this is used particularly in the States, is the Munsell colour chart. And this was originally designed to describe soil tones, although it has advanced and they new, now do have this colour as a flesh part. But again, if you're thinking about what that means, what those words mean, and um, would you want your skin to be described in relation to soil? What do we normally mean when we think of soil or dirt? We, that's not the best descriptors. One of the places I went to to look was Pantone. I know this is a great place to look for colour and colour descriptors and, you know, really accurate colour descriptors. But when I was thinking about using this in healthcare, what was apparent to me is that we would never get any consensus in this. There are so many different skin shades. It really would be unhelpful. So the one that I found that I thought was very useful was the colour bar tool by Howard Robinson. And this was... Uh, published in 2015 and there was actually a very nice piece of research, research validating this tool uh, and looking at how there was good inter-rater reliability so if you asked the patient to describe where their skin sat against this if you asked multiple clinicians to describe where skin sat against this you got good consistency what is important is that the testing was all done on the upper inner arm. So underneath the arm just here. That's important because that's seen as reflective of a skin that's not been exposed to sun. So it's less likely to have darkened and tanned with sun exposure. It's not just in our field that we're starting to see this debate around erythema and redness. There's a really nice resource about skin diversity and erythema descriptions from the British Association of Dermatology. You can see the links there. We'll happily provide the link for you after this. And this really explains quite well uh, about that thing about erythema is a symptom, but how in differently pigmented skin you see things differently. And one of the other things that I found quite challenging when we started to talk about this was I talked to lots of people about we need to start considering dark skin tones. And, and I just want to explain this little di the diagrams about my background and I'll explain why. So the top one is where I grew up. I grew up in Oldham. Um, and as you can see, we had a reasonably high Asian population. We were only we were 77 percent white, but a mixture of other things. I then went to be a nurse and I trained in London. And in my first year, I worked in Hackney. I loved working in Hackney. And you can see it was a much more diverse culture that I worked in. Uh, here, you're talking of less than 50% white population. However, for the last uh, 20 plus years, I have lived in a very rural village in Bedfordshire. And you can see from that bottom graph, this is a representation of my local population, where over 97% of the population are white. And I know lots of nurses that I've spoken to have said to me, I work in whichever county it may be, and we are not a very diverse population. So I'm not sure that this applies to me. Now, at first, I think I agreed with that. But actually, the more I talked about it, the more I realised, actually, that's completely the wrong way to look at it. Because if you work in an area of low diversity, then assessing dark skin tones is probably not going to be something you are familiar with. If you work in Hackney, you see patients with different skin tones all the time and you get better at looking for things and you're much more used to it. If you live where I do, you don't see it very often. So when you are faced with a patient with a dark skin tone, actually, you might not be as confident or as competent at doing it. So it's more important that you if you work in an area that's not diverse, 
that actually you spend a little bit more time looking at and understanding what it will look like in different skin tones. So the important thing in the best practice document is that it says this and it emphasizes this so that regardless of your patient demographics, clinicians must have the knowledge and awareness to provide optimal care for all. You must be really clued in at looking at patient's skin irrespective of the color. Because what underpins all of this is good skin assessment. And we have really good data from big studies like the guest data, the burden of wounds data, that tells us that one of the areas we fall down is in, in assessment. And that's primarily in wound assessment, but we can extend that to talk about skin assessment. And I think some of the failings that we have are that we rely very much on what we see because it's very quick. And particularly over the last 18 months, it has become much harder or less encouraged to physically touch patients. So we're trying not to transmit the virus. So we are wearing gloves more often, we are wearing layers of clothing between us and patients don't actually want us touching them in the same way that me, we may be more careful. But the reality is, is that we should be using touch and we should be using conversation to find out about the patient's skin and what it's normally like and what it feels like. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. It's really important to listen to the patient's perspective and that helps us to, to do a better assessment, but also leads us to better choices for, based on their needs and preferences. And I think it goes back to this anxiety about how do we speak to somebody who is different to us? And we really need to just be professional about it. This is a professional conversation. It's about undertaking a good assessment and we need to frame the conversation in that way. One of the things that's really important is to be comparing similar areas. So when I showed you the Hohen Robinson chart, I said very clearly, you look at the underneath of the upper arm because that gives you an unskin blemished area. And particularly when you look at black skin, you see this much more noticeably. If you look at the palm surface or if you look at the sole of the foot, what you will see is they are very pale compared to the rest of the limb. So if you were looking at a heel and you can see on the left here a picture of a patient with a, um, a heel blister, it's, it's actually quite important that you compare it to the other foot if they do have another foot, if they're not a diabetic patient or a, a, you know, they've had one limb amputated, so that you're comparing the same area of skin. Because you can compare it to some of the surrounding skin, but you might see a difference in the skin colour if it's on the sole of the foot compared to the back of the heel. If you're taking a photograph of a wound in dark skin tones, you should be using a calibrated colour indicator. There's uh, research that's published in the document that tells you actually when we started doing photography, so way back when photographs were new, it was only ever designed to do white skin because that's what it was designed for. That was what was considered appropriate at the time. So you'll start to see now that some of the companies who do photography or do some of the wound management digital systems, they're producing color balancing wheels. So um, your medical photography department might use the little square that's got the red, green, yellow, black on it. That's very good for balancing out those tones, but it doesn't necessarily pick up the nuances that you see in dark skin tones. So you might want to look um, at some of those color balance wheels. If you're assessing patients' lower legs, then remember we're not just looking for erythema as, as we're looking at in pressure ulcers, we're looking at other skin changes as well, and they may appear different to how they appear in white skin. And if you are really only familiar with using uh, looking at patients with white skin, then you need to start looking at images, start talking to people about what this may look like in a different skin tone. So you can see here, we've got two pictures uh, kindly provided by Leanne Atkin uh, from Mid Yorkshire, looking at venous staining in the lower leg. So venous staining, you know, we typically call it, it can be red brown. If you imagine trying to overlay brown on a skin that's brown already, how easy is that to see? But I think you would agree, actually, it's quite obvious, particularly in, in the picture on the right, where you've got both legs, I can quite clearly see that demarcation where what you've got is a different color. So using the phrase change in color actually allows us to be more consistent and to look at what we're, we are seeing across all the different skin tones. 
So within the document, there is this guidance about if you're looking at particular types of wounds, what you might be looking at, they really do focus on a change in the skin color, but they also talk about the change in skin texture and skin temperature. And those are really important because if you are thinking about inflammation, you will definitely see a change in texture and you will definitely, sorry, see, feel a change in texture and feel a change in temperature. That may be slightly different in the diabetic foot where you've got a suppressed immune response. You might not be seeing that in the same way, but you will certainly see other things. And it's really important that we get the patient engaged in telling us what's happening. So the patients may report pain, they may report numbness or itching or just a change in sensation. They may tell you that they're uncomfortable. And the patient themselves is the best person to describe that something is different. We've known that in the pain literature for a long time. So certainly and um, when we're looking for infection in venous leg ulcers, one of the really early indicators is the patient telling us about a change in their pain. So this is another really good example of getting patients to tell us about a change in their skin, whether that is in the, the cut, so it's a difference in colour, whether it's a difference in the texture, whether it's a difference in the temperature, or whether it's a difference um, in the feel of that skin. And some patients will very typically describe that type of the skin before we see blistering and again with blistering we don't always see it as quickly in dark skin if the, if the patient develops a blister that we miss and it pops it's a portal for infection and increases the risk of sepsis so the final uh, element of the best practice statement that i wanted to share with you is this really strong message that in all wound types and in all skin conditions it's really important to be aware of how signs and symptoms may present across all the skin tones and hopefully if we take this message on board it will help to improve our assessment in dark skin tones but I think it will also significantly help us approve our assessment in other skin tones as well so whether you are dealing with a white skin a brown skin or a black skin getting it right, doing a, an assessment that relies on all our senses can only be helpful. Thank you very much. Now, hi, Nisha, thank you. So I'm really delighted to have Nisha with us, as I said at the beginning, and as well as being a lecturer in <clears throat> undergraduate nursing, she is doing her doctoral studies looking at this topic and I'll let her tell you a little bit more about that work. Thanks, Nisha. That's okay. Um, so I will share a presentation with you if that's all right. Okay, so um, with regards to the study that I actually did, um, I did a collective case study to critically examine the teaching addressing pressure ulcer identification in people with dark skin tones. Um, and there are my supervisors on the side just to acknowledge their input into this work. So what did I actually do? Um, the principal aim of the project was to critically evaluate the education that student nurses were going through, through the lens of pressure ulcers and people with dark skin tones. So it's important to recognise that there's more than 1,300 new pressure ulcers that occur monthly in the UK. So in 2020, there, were two, there have been two independent UK reports that have been published. Um, one of which is Membrace, which relates to mothers um, from black and Asian backgrounds were more likely to um, have ill effects of childbirth um, and post childbirth. Um, we've also got obviously the COVID-19, the report that came out in 2020 around people from a black, Asian and minority ethnic background who are more likely to um, develop COVID-19 and die of um, COVID-19. So it's well known that people from a BAME background um, are prematurely and disproportionately affected by the early onset of disease and by leading causes of death compared to white counterparts. So dark skin tones rarely show the blanching response and erythema may be harder to detect on visual inspection, as Jackie mentioned in the previous presentation. So the NMC actually require that all pre-registration nursing curricula state a commitment to equality, diversity and inclusion. And this particularly became relevant in um, 2010 
when there were documents around inclusion and diversity and the importance of equity in teaching within the classroom. So like I said, the aim of the study was to evaluate the educational preparation of registered nurses and what were they being taught in the classroom. So like any piece of research, I needed to establish what was actually being taught in the classroom. Um, well, what, what literature was actually out there before even establishing what was being taught in the classroom. So you can see from this diagram here that um, I looked at three different uh, um, search engines to look at what was being included in the literature. And you can see a range of terms that were searched because of the evolution of terminology around pressure ulcers, pressure injury, depending on what part of the world you are, it is often termed differently. And then we had the concept, I had the concept of race, ethnicity, and like Jackie said, ethnicity does not indicate skin color. So it was important to capture all those components when looking at the literature. And actually what the literature came out with, which wasn't surprising to me, but maybe surprising to some of you, is that actually, Pressure, people were, if they had darker skin tones, were more likely to die because they had more severe pressure ulcers. And that is what the literature was saying. Um, so it's important to capture what was actually happening in the classroom. We couldn't just leave it as um, people with dark skin tones are more likely to die. And therefore we needed to capture what we needed to do. So what I set out to do was a mixed method sequential case study which included documentary analysis and observation of classroom teaching to find out actually what was being taught in the classroom. And the second part of it was interviewing nurse educators and having focus groups with students to find out what actually they felt they were being taught in the classroom. And what did the nurse educators actually feel that um, they were delivering in the classroom? So on this slide, you can see the results from the quantitative um, elements, which was the development of a diversity observation teaching tool. So with this tool, I could look at what was being taught in the classroom, and I could also look at the teaching plans to see actually what was predicted to be taught in the classroom. Was it actually happening in the classroom? Was there more in the classroom or actually less? And was there inclusion of skin tone diversity in the classroom around pressure ulcers? Um, and what we actually, what I actually found was that the teaching was very superficial and tokenistic in nature, and that we weren't in the classroom teaching about skin tone diversity in relation to pressure ulcers. Therefore, we could draw a conclusion that we were perpetuating color blindness, that we were treating everyone the same, that we were sort of making the assumption that color didn't matter, but actually color does matter, and we need to highlight that there's an issue because people are dying, because of poor early identification of pressure ulcers, because we have a reliance on observation around redness. Think about your paperwork that you're actually looking in practice and using in practice. When we say a change of color, are you automatically assuming redness or have you changed that terminology? Are you thinking outside the box and not being colorblind? So here from the quantitative results, what was important to highlight was actually that um, the images that was in the classroom, because we are dependent on images, that is what portrays a variance across skin tones other than us talking about it. So the visual representation of people across the skin tone continuum is one of the most measurable ways in which skin tone diversity can and should be represented and accounted for in the classroom. But across the five cases, which is what I did, I went to five different HEIs to see what was being taught. So it wasn't just one case, there are actually five cases that this data came from, and it was across the whole of England. So you can see the small proportion of number of pictures of people with dark skin tones in relation to people who were white, and therefore we are not being representative. So the second part of the study was around the qualitative findings. And you can see on this slide that there were four main themes that came from what the student nurses were saying and what the nurse educators were saying. So there was a dominance of whiteness in the teaching and learning of pressure ulcers in undergraduate nurse education. 
the impact and implications of whiteness as the norm in pressurized the teaching. So actually, the way that students were being taught in the classroom were impacting the way they, they practiced, that they carried out assessments. So it was an ongoing thing. So we need to ensure that change happens. The role of external inputs on the teaching and learning of pressure ulcers in on-campus undergraduate nurse education. As you all know, you, um, we have guest tissue viability nurses. We have external resources that come into the university um, to support the teaching and learning. However, in the qualitative um, findings, there was an indication that despite specialists coming in, there wasn't the inclusion of skin tone diversity and that there was still a dominance of whiteness. There was the hope that nurse educators talked about, that they hoped guest speakers would talk about diversity, but in the cases that they'd seen, they didn't actually see that being portrayed. So changing and what the students, the nurse educators then felt because we were having these discussions was actually how do we then change this practice of skin tone diversity and make improvements in the classroom so people can actually understand and make a change. So from this picture, I've talked about pressure ulcers, but I want to make it more broader. There's a baby. Can we think of actually this baby has jaundice? He's actually my son who's got jaundice when he was born. And I was told before being discharged that actually um, he's fine. We're just going to do a, a, a bilirubin test. And actually we were in the, the next minute we were in um, intensive care. So it's, it isn't about what you can see in front of you. It is broader. You need to be thinking more broadly. It affects people every day when we're not being inclusive and thinking about the picture of what we can do. So what can you do about it? You need to be able to self-reflect. We all need to acknowledge skin tone diversity exists and we can't be blind to it. You will feel uncomfortable. I've done this research for the past six years and whenever I talk about this topic, people feel uncomfortable. They don't know how to talk about it. And therefore we need to be, take responsibility to educate our future generation of nurses. We have a role to play in contributing to equity in healthcare, and we need to break down systematic racism. You need to self-reflect, you need to think, are you actually being colorblind and treating everyone the same? Because actually we don't treat everyone the same. People with dark skin tones, including myself, need to be seen as someone with dark skin because we are at more risk of poor detection of various different things. So consider what your teaching material is and consider your classroom presence. So there um, are my publications. So with regards to diversity inclusion tool, if you want to reflect on your education itself, you can use the paper there to, that's got a um, an example of the structured tool. And there's also um, the more details around my study. And there are some other resources that can, um, you can use to, in, to educate yourselves. And there are the references. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Nisha, that was, that was really helpful. Um, and I think that we've got quite a few questions coming through already. So I'm just going to look at the So there's been a couple of questions that we've answered very quickly, which were the obvious ones about are the slides available? The slides aren't available to hand out, but this is available on uh, catch up. So you can watch it again from the TBS website and the document is freely available to download. So much of what I talked about certainly is available in that document and many of Nisha's references are also in there. So we, we've had uh, a few questions come through, Nisha. I think it'd be helpful if we could maybe go through those a little, a little bit and sort of see what people are talking about. Um, a couple of them uh, relate to you know, the difficulties in assessment. Um, in, in particular, so one of the ones uh, I've identified is about, is this harder in the home setting? So you know, in hospital, we tend to have good lighting and things so we, we can see patients more clearly but you know you just gave the example of your son who was presumably in hospital you gave birth in hospital and and that was missed 
Do you think it's much harder in a patient's own home? My background's district nursing, um, so very much aware of poor lighting at home. Um, and it's about asking the patient, like you said, Jackie, before, it's asking the patient, actually, is there a difference? Or if the patient can't see because it's on their bottom, it's actually asking their carer if they have a carer there or support system. Actually, is this different? Does it look different? So, yes, it can be more complex because the lighting is poor, but I don't think it will make significant difference in identifying the skin change colour because um, someone will know if their skin looks different. Yeah, and you know, if we go back to what I said about it's not just about looking as well, is it? It's about using your hands and feeling and touching and seeing what goes there. Do you think we are challenged by the lack of uh, images that we have? You know, we really struggled, didn't we, to get images for the document? Um, I think so, is that because <laughs> if we type on Google, there are just no images there. And that's been historic. And that is really what I found in my study is that it, the, this non-inclusion is really the tip of the iceberg, that actually there's an underlying reason as to why we don't have these pictures like you spoke about um even photography was based on people from a white background so the images haven't been there and hopefully with this new document coming out that this will get people to think about taking more pictures and identifying that there's a difference and i think you know, one of the things that i um wanted to mention was about the impact of scarring on wings i just want to share a picture again to show you this so i've got i've got two things here hopefully that you can see on this slide and um, about skin assessments i've mentioned good lighting being really important but um and, and i'm struggling with the light you can probably tell i've got the sunlight streaming in on me today which is not being very helpful for me and um, i wanted to show a picture of um a wound that's healing. So if you look at this wound here, so this is quite black skin, but you can see that as the patient has had a wound and the wound heals, the change in skin color is significant. And, and you, you were there at uh, Harrogate, Nisha, there was a debate about, again, what that change in skin color means to that patient. So depending on the cause of the wound, you know, if it was a traumatic wound, it's a very visible reminder. Of, of what happens to them. If it's a pressure ulcer, depending on where the body is, it may or may not be visible. But what does that change in skin tone mean for the patient? And is this something we should be addressing as well? What would you be your view on that, Nisha? Sorry, I didn't hear that last bit. And so where a patient has, so with, a patient with dark skin has got this suddenly got a scar that looks very different to the rest of the skin. Should we be offering them opportunities? So there was a discussion about medical tattooing and matching skin. Should that be something we think about? Yes, it is definitely, because this is something else. What, when I was actually doing the um, interviews with nurse educators was around this scarring that some parents don't actually know that there will be a differentiation in skin color because if you've got darker skin that it will turn pink and that it actually won't ever go back to a completely black black skin or dark skin that there will always be that variation so definitely there would be the importance to recognize actually how do we do that especially thinking about pediatrics if they've had a wound on their face or somewhere that can affect them throughout their life lifetime Actually, it's important to consider that, yes. Yeah, and I think, again, that's something that hasn't been picked up as, you know, we focused on finding the wound, but not what happens when wound has happened and leaves us with a change. And um, so we've got a couple of questions in the question answer session, something from, from Cathy Tan, who's worked in Leicester, trained in Peckham, lived in Croydon, and, and working in a rural area, is finding that she's having to challenge the norm and spend time discussing this. But she's raised a question about, she's recently checked the Mouth Care Matters content, which doesn't mention mouth assessment. And um, is that something that you're seeing, Nisha? Is it, is it become very focused on wounds and in particular I think on pressure ulcers and um, yes it is definitely around pressure ulcers and I think some of it has come from my research um around pressure ulcers but you can see from my presentation itself it's not only pressure ulcers it comes with um childbirth like with jaundice it comes with um 
domestic violence as well. So if you look at various different reports, people from a black or Asian background who have dark skin, but actually doesn't state about the skin color, but there's an assumption that because of skin color, we're not seeing the bruises, we're not seeing the injuries, and therefore there's less likely to be um, legal action taken against the perpetrator. So there's definitely, it's definitely much broader than pressure ulcers and wounds. And I think it is a good point, isn't it? You know, uh, it's always, I've always found it challenging that it came out because of pressure ulcers and it almost felt like we were being picked on. Whereas in fact, if you look at that list of things that I said, you know, we, inflammation, the cardinal signs of inflammation, heat, redness, pain, swelling, loss of function. And, and if that's embedded through all clinical training, it's such a huge thing to think about how we start to change and we've had a question which is about how do we start to implement this change in practice you know what can people do with the document and how can we make these changes what would be your you know one really strong tip Nisha? um i think it's about being aware that this is an issue and disseminate it across um because we need to be able to talk about it to make a difference and the what the document does is give you an aid to facilitate that communication. Because if we're saying to, um, if we're in an area that people are generally don't have dark skin, and that's what happened from my research is actually students and nurse educators were saying, well, in my area, we don't have. And you, that's just not a suitable answer because the less likely you're coming across this, then you need to understand it even more. And I think what the document does is just offers that insight for you to look back and go, yes, um, here's some guidance that I can refer. And if someone's feeling uncomfortable to talk about it, there's the document to support you to talk about it. And I think that was really evident when we did the presentation in Harrogate, wasn't it? We had quite a senior clinician say, stand up and say, I feel very uncomfortable. I don't know how to manage this. And we need to get over that. We need to treat this professionally and um, in the same way as we would with anything else you know when HIV first came onto the scene in the 1980s I was a, a new staff nurse working in London and we people didn't talk about it it was all behind closed doors and whispers and that's how things get blown out of proportion how things don't get managed this is something that is you know is with us now forever more we are a much more diverse population than we've ever been and we need to professionalize that language and we need to um, start to talk about it there's been quite a few comments in the chat about is this an education issue do we need to start to talk about it in pre-registration absolutely we do but education is our future workforce. We have a very big workforce out there now. A lot of them who are you know, my age, considerably older than you are, Nisha, um, and this was never taught to us. And they're the people who are giving care. We need to get this into their education, into their language, into their documentation as well, don't we? Definitely, because what some of the students in the focus groups actually said is, we. when I did the research, we were mentors at that point, and I know it's changed supervisors, but... Um, they were scared to tell their mentors at the time um, that actually this isn't how, even if they had black skin themselves or dark skin themselves, they wouldn't challenge their mentor because they saw them as a role model and as important um, aspect of their learning and would never challenge them. So yes, definitely important to address in post-registration nursing as much as in pre-reg so that we can come together to uh, address the issue. And I think when we start taking it away from wound care as well and make it a piece of clinical information, that if you are looking at inflammation, whether that's due to infection, whether it's due to having a mouth ulcer or a wound, then if somebody has dark skin, you need to look for different things. And it's an interesting concept about mouth ulcers because the skin, it's a bit like looking at the um, soles of the feet and the palms of the hand, isn't it? The skin colour is different or the, the mucosal membrane is a different colour. But that colour varies in the same way that it varies between individuals. Yes, and, and we're just good at doing that level of assessment. Um, another question about, um, do we know how many category one pressure ulcers we miss during, because we're only looking for redness and not knowing what else to assess? Did you, well, I think that's a very difficult thing to say, isn't it? You don't know what you've missed until you've missed it. <laughs> 
Yes, and what the what the um, literature was actually saying was that they didn't count um, category one pressure ulcers in their um, in their data because they realised that we couldn't identify um, category one pressure ulcers in people with dark skin tone. So actually, often it's dismissed and not even included in the literature because of it. And um, so there's definitely. And it's interesting. That we don't count category ones in anybody. Yeah. And my understanding of that was always was not about not being able to see them. It was because there are so many of them and they generally resolve so quickly. But maybe they resolve so quickly because although we don't report them, people see and do something. Whereas if you are a, a person with a dark skin tone, the redness isn't seen. So the intervention isn't put into place. Yes. And then the result of having more severe pressure ulcers at a category two or above for people with dark skin because by the time we're seeing it there's actually an open wound yeah there's a there was a very interesting paper published some time ago now i think it was 2005 or 2006 done in the netherlands and at the time what they were looking at was the spend on equipment and they had uh, two identical as identical as they could be wards and in one ward they used the Bruin score to decide when the patient got its equipment and in the second ward they used the appearance of non-blanching erythema and what they found was that the patients got the same number and severity of pressure ulcers but on the ward where they looked at non-blanching erythema they only used a third of the equipment so you know they were really using the redness as a as an indicator of when care should be escalated but that's a really dangerous strategy, given what we've just talked about. Yes, because we uh, will inadvertently miss more um, pressure ulcers among people with dark skin tone. Yeah, just just change the topic slightly. So I've had a question about um, different colours of dressings and bandages. And I know this was something we talked about and is covered in the document, isn't it? About should we have lots of different ranges of, of skin colour? Do you want to give your view, Nisha, and then I'll, I'll summarise what's in the document? Yeah, so um, uh, you've probably seen supermarkets are changing and having a broader colour. But we've spoken about um, dressings being pink and actually no one's skin is that colour. Um, and really it's what we've we've spoken about is actually is the dressing a particular color because so, so we can actually see the blood or the exudate coming out hence the reason for having white plasters rather than having um dark black plasters um so yeah it's it's a bit hard as to actually what is the reason we're putting that plaster on is it for a clinical need around seeing the exudate or is it actually um patient comfort and we talked quite a lot about that, didn't we? You know, we, we said none of them are anybody's skin colour unless you've got a very strange skin colour. And the need to look at exudate management or identify, particularly if you've got you know, like a pseudomomacy exudate. But we also talked about the flip side about that, where you do want a dressing to be less visible. And that might be about somebody with dementia or a child where, where if it's obvious they're going to pick it off, you know, or play with it. And changing the colour of the dressing is probably not going to make a difference to those scenarios. What you need a distraction text, what you need is to cover the dressings up. And it's not the same as saying, oh, that patient's scar is a very different colour to their skin because the, the dressing is serving a different function. It's there to indicate what's going on in the wound a lot more. Um, a couple of other, I think there are more points in the questions and answers, two from Alison Parnham saying, um, I think pain is a very important warning sign, even when we can't see damage. Absolutely, Alison. We, I think we underestimate pain. And my big thing I think that's underestimated is itch. First signs is often itch and discomfort. Um, and I mentioned that the Pan Pacific uh, Pressure Injury Association, so the PPIA website, have some great images of skin tone diversity. And um, there's also a question on there from Esther about why are all patients prescribed the same cream for pressure ulcers? So skins are different. And um, I think that's quite a tricky question, Esther. We we talked a little bit about moisturisation, didn't we, Nisha, and whether there is a difference, particularly in um, some of the black skins where they seem to be a bit drier. Yes. And then that came up in the focus groups that actually students kept on referring to oh, we treat people with dark skin tones differently, they have different creams. It's about asking what the patient, what, you, what they use. 
and actually what mm. serves better for them. Um, and are we talking about treatment or actually are we looking at patient comfort again and around what products are they using and what works best for them? I'm not aware of any research that shows the skin protectants, the skin films stick or stay or wash off any differently on, a, on any different skin texture. Because if that was the case, we would have to reconsider them in, in use in patients with dry skin conditions like psoriasis, like eczema as well. And they are widely used across those range of, of skin diseases. Have you come across anything, Nisha? No, there's, I haven't seen any literature around that at all. It's just mm. um, around clinician comfort and what they feel comfortable talking about. Because from the data that I collected, students and nurse educators talked about they wouldn't even want to ask what type of cream in case they were offending. Um, but it's actually using that professional language to personalise your care. We can't make assumptions that we're personalising care if we don't talk to our patients about it. Absolutely. And I'm just looking at the comments in the chat. So Tina Chambers has made a point about plaster casts. If you give people a choice of colour, particularly children, they don't go for white. They go for a bright colour. They go for the ones with uh, pictures on it. Uh, you know, and I think that's, that's a very relevant point. Um, I've had a question about the asking stop the pressure um, framework. I think we already incorporate assessing dark skin tones within the asking framework because the skin assessment is very much based on what we've we've just talked about. It is about skin assessment and care. It does encourage you to use touch and feel. And we, we wrote um, a nice short document as part of a nursing time series. And there's a table in there that very clearly tells you that when you touch the patient's skin, what you are looking for so that you're looking for hardness or induration or you're looking for the squelchy bumps you're looking for temperature change whether that's heat or cold and you're looking for change in color so i think we have got it in there i know certainly in terms of the national wound care strategy we are going to be looking back across all of our assets to ensure that we have picked this up and I know one of the areas that I think we'll need to revisit is when we had the wound assessment sequin for community in 2016, 2017, whenever that was, there was the development of a um, minimum data set for what you should be assessing in a wound. And I know that in the surrounding skin, this wasn't addressed. So we'll have to pick it up in that. And we're revisiting our lower limb clinical navigation tool. And Nisha's very kindly advising us on that work to make sure that we are picking up things where we need to do so. Just quickly skimming through. Um, uh, uh, uh. And so uh, Avi has put a comment about how dramatic it would be to have a medical device that can detect uh, pressure injury early. Uh, yes, it would be. And somebody posted about SEMScan, and I do, you know, we're not here to promote any company's product. I know there is one paper that's looked at SEMScanner, but if you are looking at medical devices that can um, detect pressure inju injury early, there's some really amazing work being done by the Medical Device and Vulnerable Skin Network down in Southampton. Um, and they are looking at skin markers. So they're looking at things like sweat metabolites. So things that are produced as a response to inflammation. So metabolites that are produced as a response to inflammation that are picked up by a kind of a blotting paper or an assay that will flag that there are those early signs of skin damage. And that goes back to what we were saying right at the beginning. This is about a physiological response, but we have relied on one way of assessing that physiological response, and that's looking at things visually rather than looking at how else we could do that. And I think as technology advances in the same way, we're seeing a whole host of things that we can check other elements of wound care. You know, we can look for infection, we can dipstick things. I, I hope we will see better supports and guidance to help us to assess darker skin. I'm, I'm really conscious of the time issue. We've got something like three minutes left. Are there any kind of final comments you want to say, anything you want to round up with? It's with regards to the medical devices, actually, um, which would be good to round up on because they are really good instruments. However, I've been a district nurse for many years now, even though I do look young. It's been a while. Um, we were lucky to have a thermometer in our bags. Um, 
So we need to be aware and take responsibility as clinicians ourselves that actually we can't be reliant on machinery or medical devices. We need to be comfortable in breaking down those barriers and talking to people about their skin tone and actually identifying what can we do um, with the minimal equipment that we have to support our patients in the best possible way we can. And that, that's a really good point to, to finish on. I think, Nish, you know, we do become over-reliant on equipment. What do you do when your automated blood pressure monitor breaks? You have to go and get one you can do yourself. And the best way to check a patient's condition is to put your hand on skin. There is nothing to replace actually taking a patient's pulse. Because in doing that, you are sharing contact with the patient. You are feeling the texture and the temperature of their skin, as well as checking the regularity and the frequency of their pulse. And that, that human touch is really important. And my personal view is that we over rely on gloves, that we seem to forget that we can put our hands on patients and we can wash our hands and we can do that very effectively. So I wouldn't like to think that we were going to rely on equipment to do this for us. It has to be about communication, both verbal communication and touch communication. So unless anybody else has any final questions, I'm conscious that we're right at the end, just to say thank you very much for joining us on this skin assessment um, element of the Stop the Pressure Week webinars. And thank you to 3M for sponsoring this. It's been really great to have another audience to, to communicate these messages to. And we hope that you log in and download the document, that you go to the Tish Viability Society webpage and you can watch again and see the information if there's anything you want to pick up on. But that you most importantly tell everybody what we have been talking about today and encourage them to be doing a better assessment of patient skin. Thank you very much. <laughs>